I kind of want to share a heart, my heart with you. Psalm 63 and verse 1. In the middle of your Bible, Psalm 63 and verse 1. These two verses, <clears throat> Psalm 63, if you'll stand with me, please. We'll read together verses 1 and 2. We'll read aloud as you stand for the reading of God's Word. Psalm 63, <clears throat> 1 and 2. Let's begin. O God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee. My soul thirsteth for Thee. My flesh longeth for Thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see Thy power and Thy glory, so as I have seen Thee in the sanctuary. After 39 years of being a Christian, I'm saved 39 years yesterday, my spiritual birthday. Of the two, it's the better birthday to have. But of my 30 years of being, 39 years of being a Christian, I have one desire, and that is to experience more than just ordinary Christianity. I'm tired of the same old, same old. I want God to do something wonderful, and I want to see it. I want to be there when it happens. I want to see God do things that only He can do. So let's pray that we all have that same desire. Father, right now, we come before you and with a somber, sober spirit, ask you to show up this morning, bring conviction to every heart, and then bring encouragement. Help not only the men, but the women, the teenagers, boys, girls, help us all to yearn, O oh God, for thy power, like we've never seen. We know you're capable, but we need you to show it in our midst, in this sanctuary, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> now, what was it like to see God's power and glory? Well, you're in Psalms. Go to Psalm 44, verse 1. Psalm 44. In verse 1, <clears throat> Psalm 44 in verse 1, we have heard with our ears. You know, one of the greatest gifts you can give your children is the hearing of the works of God. Kids are growing up and they're, all they think about is themselves and they think about people and they think about projects. And they need to hear about the wonderful works of God. Here is David writing, he says, We've heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days, in the times of old. <clears throat> How thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand, and plant us, our people, the Israelites. How thou didst afflict the people and cast them out. We heard about how you brought victory in the promised land. I think about, I mean, you can go back before that. And, you know, in, in Job chapter 38, you're in Psalm. Let me take you there. Go to Job, the very, the, the very next book to the left, Job chapter 38. And I want you to see how angels saw God create the entire universe. Must have been awesome. Must have been absolutely mind-boggling. Job chapter 38, verse 4 now, God is talking to Job, and he asks Job, he says, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it, like measuring lines and building? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Tell me now. Or who laid the cornerstone of the earth thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for what? I mean, to see God, <laughs> stars and galaxies and planets and comets and, and, and beauty, and they just went, wow. They got to see the creation's entire universe. You know, every time you look up and you see the sun, the moon, the stars, and that starry sky, they're screaming out, saying, the glory of God. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Noah he built that ark, it was quiet. He, raising up those massive wood planks and attaching them one by one for a hundred years, he built that ark and the heavens were silent. 
People laughed. His sons were tired. His wife was probably complaining. This is going on too long. Nothing's happening. And then when God said, get in the ark, and they got in that ark, and God closed that door, and for seven days, silence until the first thunder, and then the first patter of rain, and then they heard the power of God rain down judgment on this whole world. He saw the power of God, and he rode out that storm for 370 days. Lot saw the power and the glory of God as the fire of God fell on Sodom and Gomorrah, judging that whole area for their wicked sin. He saw it, and it terrified him. Moses saw the glory of God in that little burning bush. He got up to the top of that mountain, seen a little flickering flame. He says, why didn't that thing burn out? And he got up there, and he talked with God. And he, in, in that little burning bush... There was a, a, a light that was brighter than the fire, so much so when he came down, the people said, his face is shining. And he had to put a veil over it because everybody couldn't listen to him because all they did was look at his face. But he saw the glory of God in that little bush. Israel saw the glory of God. when God split that Red Sea with uh, Pharaoh and his army behind them, and they're trapped at the edge of the ocean there, and God just began to blow, and that Red Sea split, and for 12 hours, it held up there, and they walked right on through, and they danced all their way through, going, this is the power of God. Then Israel got up every morning for six days, every week, they saw God put manna on the ground, like getting breakfast in bed. And they reached down there with a little doughy, and they would mix it into uh, balls and then flat it out and make bread. And they would have bread, fresh bread every morning for six days. They'd have twice the amount on, on Friday. So on Saturday, they didn't, they didn't do any cooking. But for over 38 years, they saw the power of God providing for every one of their needs. They got one day where they had no water, and God said, hit the rock, Moses. Hit the rock? It's a rock, Lord hit the rock, Moses, and he went up there and hit it, and that thing gushed forth with enough water for a man and a half people. They saw the power of God. They saw the glory of God, but it got better. It got better when Jesus came because the disciples saw Jesus walking on a stormy water. I can't imagine. I've walked in all I take. We, we got a, uh, actually it was John and Ruth. They found a trampoline for free. And so all of a sudden, <clears throat> we've got this trampoline in our back garden again. We thought we got rid of it, and Nita's going, yay! So we've got this trampoline in the back, and you know, you're walking on a trampoline, and it's fun, but can you imagine if the trampoline's moving? And Jesus came walking on the stormy water. It blew the minds of those disciples. They saw Jesus break a few small pieces of bread and two small fishes into small pieces and feed 5,000 men plus women and children until they were stuffed. They, decide, they watched Jesus as he reached out and healed multitudes of sick and lame and crippled and dying people. They watched the power of God, and they saw the glory of God nonstop. They watched as he even raised back to life those that had been dead for days. They saw the glory and power of God. They, the disciples heard the joy of the crowds every single day. No one went away from an encounter with Jesus disappointed. You know, you've ever been so amazed that the hair stands on your arms and on your neck? It must have been like that. I wish I had been there. I wish I could have been there. It would have been cool. I mean, I just, just, just to see one of those days. But read Psalm 63 again. Go back to Psalm 63. <clears throat> Psalm 63, 1. O God... Thankfully, thou art my God, not just the God, but you're personal, you're my God. So early will I seek thee, my soul. Why would I seek you? It's because my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and a thirsty land where no water is. What's he hungering for? What's he thirsting for? To see thy power and thy glory, so, have I ha so as I have seen thee where? In the sanctuary. You know, it's great reading about God doing great things throughout history. But nothing compares to seeing him do something, not just in the past, but right here. In the sanctuary of God's people. I've seen it in my Christian life. 
and I yearned to see it again. I sort of, I prayed and I said, Lord, bring back to memory some things that I've forgotten about how, how mighty you are. You know, I've seen God conquer proud, arrogant sinners who should have never darkened the doorway of a gospel preaching church, and yet they came. And they came, and they crumbled under the weight of their sin, and they cried out to God to save them. And they were gloriously saved. I've seen it in the sanctuary. I've seen it when a deep quieting of the hearts and the minds of people sitting in church didn't move, and they were in awe not of the preaching, not of the performance, not of the words, not of the, the expressions, not of the environment, not of the atmosphere, but of the presence of God. And they knew Jesus was there. And it's marvelous to watch. I've heard hardened, angry men weep over their anger and over their secret sins. It's the most amazing weep you'll ever hear when you hear a man cry and break and says, I've been so wrong. I've watched as people enslaved by their addictions as they were absolutely made free by the work of the Spirit of God, freeing them from impossible addictions. I've watched a bitter wife break down and go to her husband and forgive her husband and then go to her parents right in front of me and have their marriage restored and their home made new. I've watched broken men who had lost their families, lost their health, lost their joy, still decide to live for the Lord Jesus from that day forward because he's worthy. I've seen teenagers humble themselves and take the hand of their father and say, I'm so sorry, Dad. I was one of them. And then hug them for the first time in years. I don't think I hugged my dad from the time he left when I was 12 years old till I was almost 19 years old. But it was after the preaching of a man of God preaching about unforgiveness and the curse of unforgiveness that tore me to bits. And I wrote my dad a long letter and I told him I forgive him, I love him. And the next time I got to be with him, I hugged him and I had never let go. Today I wish he was alive so I could just tell him again I love him. See, God can do some things today. He can do something right here. I know what he's done in the past. But I yearn to see God do it again. I want to see the glory and the power of God in this church. I love and I yearn that this church would become burdened for souls, would become burdened for sinners instead of pleasure, would not worry about their success in the business world, but be worried about their success in the kingdom of God. I worry and I am burdened that this church would be yearning for the power of God and not the power of politics. That this church would be burdened and would be hungry for God to save our families and to save our nation. Ireland does not need to lead this world in sin. Ireland needs to lead this world back to God. And we've got to be burdened about that. I want to hear grown men say amen during the preaching of the, of the Bible. I don't want to hear just women say it. I'd like to hear some men say it. Amen. I yearn to see men make church and preaching and prayer and Bible reading and godliness number one in their lives. I hunger for God to make soul winners out of the most fearful of us. And I get terrified. I took Weston and I said, Weston, I've gotten backslid. I can't talk on the street anymore. I just stand there and I don't know what to say. Take me out on the street and make me a soul winner again. And he said, let's go on Friday. And we've been going out. And, you know, I'm standing there, and I'm going, and my brain is, is cursed because I'm going, oh, they're, they're, they're you know, they're, they'll say this, and they won't listen, and they're too busy. And I, my mind's going, and there's, there's Weston going, you believe in God? <laughs> Do you believe in God? And he's talking to 30 people, having to talk to one. And I prayed, and I got on the side there by the Peace Park, and I said, God, make me a soul winner again. Make me unafraid. I don't care what goes on inside of my head. Make something come out of my mouth. And I started talking to people again, and it felt good. Amen. I can go up to a door. I don't mind talking to somebody where I'm in control. But when you're out on the street, believe me, you're not in control. <laughs> I yearn that all of us, the most fearful of us, would become soul winners. I yearn to win souls from the power of Satan, not the easy ones, the people we think, oh, they'll get saved, oh, they'll come to church, but the ones who spit at you, the ones who curse you, the ones who are living in the grips of Satan, I want to win them. 
You may think that's just fanaticism, but it's supposed to be normal. You know, Moses, now let's go to Exodus 33. <clears throat> Moses desperately needed to see God's glory and power. Exodus 33. I don't care what's going through your head and your heart right now. I need you to stop and say, Lord, speak to me. I don't care what plans or what, what things I've got going on. I don't care where my life is. I want you to take me and put me in the middle of your will. Because I yearn for your glory and your power. And I want to see it in the sanctuary. I don't want to see it in the history books. I want to see it today. Exodus chapter 33 and verse 12 Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, bring up this people. Now he's kind of he's upset. I say he's a lot upset. Because he's, he's finding out these people are carnal. These people are backslidden. These people don't want to go forward. As a matter of fact, every, every couple of months, the people are coming up with an insurrection and trying to go back to Egypt. And he's like, I can't handle this. He said, You said unto me, bring up this people. Thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. And thou hast also, and, and you told me that I have found grace in, in my sight. You said thou hast found grace in my, in my sight. Now therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, if I am pleasing, if I am doing things right, show me now thy way, that I may know thee more, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is not my people, but whose people? The end of verse 13, that this nation is thy people, it's your responsibility. He, God, said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. I'll calm you. And he said unto him, this is Moses talking, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. I can't go another step. Verse 16, for wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? How is anybody going to know that we're your people? Is it not in that thou goest with us? The only way we're going to go forward is if you go with us, so shall we be separated I and thy people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. We're going into a life that is different and separated from the rest of the world. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, back to God, I beseech thee, show me what? Thy glory. I, I just want to, I just, I, I remember when I knelt at that, that burning bush and you told me to take my shoes off. I remember in the presence of God, I remember what it was like, and I need that again. I need to see thy power and thy glory again. You see, this chapter, chapter 33, was one of those apex or one of those pivotal moments in Moses' life and when God shows up there in just the next chapter and God passes by and he puts Moses up in the cleft of the rock there and he's sitting there, Moses sees not the face of God, he gives no form to God, but he saw the glory and the brightness and heard the voice of God and the power of God and it got him through the next 39 years. It got him through. Because Moses desperately needed to see God's power. And if, if Moses needed it, all the more we do. See, our children and children's children need to see God doing something marvelous. You can leave this now and go to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Our children do not need us, they need God. Did you hear me? We are a vapor. You could be gone tomorrow. Are you listening? You better make sure that your children have God and not just you. Amen? Amen? Our children need God. They need to trust Him. They need to know He's going to do something great and that He'll take care of them and He'll lead them. Psalm 78, verse 1. Oh, give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. And I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. I will teach you deep things which we have heard and known and our fathers told us. We will not hide these things, these teachings, from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord 
and his strength and his wonderful works that he had done. Children's children need to see God doing something marvelous in their life. They need to see prayer work instead of complaining. You know, we spend more time doing than we should complaining. And when has complaining ever done anything good? Now, yeah, if you complain, you can get a new, another bowl of soup at the restaurant. If you complain, you get a, a replacement sandwich. You, you complain, you might get somebody who got in front of you to get behind you in a line. You do all that, but when it comes to eternal things, complaining never got you one step forward. It always pulled you back. You know what you need to do? You need to pray. Our children need to see people get married who have stayed clean and pure until marriage. And then watch them be happier than the richest people in the world. Our children need to see that. Connor and Chloe and Colum and Brendan, they need to see some young people do right. They don't, we don't need to wait for them to grow up and struggle with it. We need us to struggle with it. We need the glory of God in our marriages from the start. Amen. We're too easy. We're too quick to just give to God the broken pieces after we've done everything we wanted to do and then said, now God, kind of make this thing work. He looks at you and he says, I really wish I had it at the start. Our children need to see souls getting saved. They need this. Our, I'm going to use using Connor because he's quick on my mind. I can't think of all the names. But whether it's Ethan or Nathan or Connor or Chloe, they need to see this church seeing souls saved. They need it. They need to know that people are getting saved and getting born again and living for God. They need to see their mother and fathers loving each other like Jesus loves us. Our children need God in the midst of their home. Again, I'll say it very clearly, we need to see God do what only He can do again. So what do we need God to do? If I ask you, what, what, what do you need God to do? You might start thinking, well, give me a better job, give me a wife, you know, uh, make my wife more obedient, um, uh, make my husband nicer. You know, you think about all those things. Let me tell you, you need God for everything we got to stop thinking that God is only for the disasters, for the extreme situations. We need to start to realize that every breath we take, God gave it to us. We need God. John, Jesus said in John 15, 5, he said, I am the vine, and ye are the branches, the cluster. He that abideth in me stays close to me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do God is looking for anyone who would just seek for him to show off. I don't know if you understand or not, but God's a guy. God is a guy. He likes to show off. Amen. Some of you women going, what, 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 what? Yeah, we pray our father, not our mother. God likes to show off. I need you to go to 2 Chronicles. Go to the left, 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 16.9, at a bad time in Israel's history. Listen to these wonderful words. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Wow, God wants to show off. But he's looking for somebody who wants him to show off. See, God just didn't show up and go, poof, like a magician. This is not Ireland got talent. This is God saying, does anybody need me? Does anybody love me? Does anybody want me? Yearn for me. We need God to do everything. Oh, that God would awake the slumbering hearts of God's people who have fallen away from God in this church and don't care about the gospel, don't care about souls, don't care about preaching. They will get up and walk out anytime they want. They will miss the invitation. I'm praying that God would bring a conviction to us, say we've got to value what we have here. We've got to have God for everything. Well, that God would convict men's hearts of their own sins and cause them to fear going to hell again. We need some men who fear going to hell. Because that's what got me saved. 
Amen. Half the people in this room, you got scared into salvation. You say, well, that's terrible. No, it's good. Because if you're in a car and the, the steering car, the, and I, one time I was driving an old, our old Volvo, and he doesn't remember. I don't know if I ever told you. I was driving back from Mallow, and uh, I'm driving along in there, and the wheel released from the, the steering column there, and I couldn't turn. I was on the new Mallow Road just coming off of the uh, uh, Blarney exit, coming back from Mallow, and the, the, it just disconnected. <laughs> Now, I got, a, I got a news for you. I mean, I, I hit that brake and I just, it just went forward, amen, a little bit till I bumped up and the cars were able to go around me. But I tell you what, if you're traveling at high speed, and I thank God it didn't happen while I was on the, 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 the new Mallow Road there, uh, coming down at, at 100 kilometers an hour, who knows what would have happened. But I know this, if somebody said, jump, guess what I would have done? I would have jumped, man. And when somebody says, get saved, you need to get saved. Because there is a, there is a hell out there waiting for everybody who does not. I pray that God tears down the strongholds. I think I have this. God would tear down the strongholds that's in our culture. You know, it's not just the pubs anymore that are filled with wickedness. It's the hotels. It's what's on TV. It's what's on the Internet. And I just, I, I, I pray, you, you guys think I'm crazy, but for most of my Christian life here for the last 25 years, almost every pub that I pass by, I try and pray, God, tear that down. God, I pray that thing closes down. God, I don't, I, I don't want that to be anything but a pile of rubble. Amen. Now, I don't, I don't claim any success. I just know what my desire is, and I've seen a bunch of them close down. Amen. And I'd like to see more of them. And I pray that God would give Ireland another chance to get saved before eternity closes its doors. I'm praying for repentance among us. I'm praying that we get along, that we love one another, that we love God. I'm praying that we, we beg God for 250 people next Sunday. Don't just say, well, pastor's praying for that. I hope one person comes. No, why don't you pray for 250? Why don't you pray with me and beg God for something marvelous in our midst so that we can see uh, a, 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 the glory of God and the power of God in the preaching of the Word of God. That's what I want. I'm praying Bruce Fry would preach like he's never preached before. I'm praying for good weather. We know how hard that is. Amen. But what's hindering us? Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59 starts with us. Isaiah 59 and verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Just stop there for a second. God has not grown old and tired and feeble. The God who created everything from nothing, the God that holds every atom in, play, in place is still there and very able to do anything. His hand hasn't shriveled up. His back is not bent over. He's not sitting in an old rocking chair up in heaven watching uh, one foot in the grave. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. That's layer upon layer upon layer above impossibility. So what's hindering us? Lack of belief. John chapter 11. I'll show you something interesting. John chapter 11. The very same chapter that Brother Alquist preached last week, but only want to show you one phrase here in John chapter 11 in verse 38. John eleven thirty eight. Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. This is Lazarus' grave, and it was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Now, of course, Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, wait a minute. <laughs> By this time he, what? He stinketh. For he hath been dead four days. And Jesus saith unto her, watch this, 
said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldest see the what? The glory of God. He didn't say, Martha, who's a good worker? Martha was a hard worker. Martha, you want 10, 20 Marthas in a church. You can't build a church without Marthas. But Martha's so busy thinking about what to do and how to fix and, 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 and facing problems and trying to get things all worked out. Jesus says, I want you just to believe and you'll see the glory of God. There in um, verse 41, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stood by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. I, I told them to watch for your glory, and when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Do you think Anybody there expected Lazarus to get up? Not on your life. He's dead for days. It is stinking in there. And Jesus cries out, Lazarus, come forth. Verse 44, and he that was dead came forth. <laughs> Can you imagine? I don't think anybody breathed. They're just watching this man bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with an, also about with a napkin. And Jesus saith unto them, don't just stand there, because he's standing there, and, and nobody's moving. And he says, lose him. <laughs> go free him. Let him go. I think one of the reasons, I think one of the second big reason why we don't see big things happening in our sanctuary, in our midst, is because we, we lack belief and trust in him. And we're, we're unaware, we're unaware that two kingdoms are at war. The kingdoms of this world where we live and the kingdom of God. Do you ever realize who's actually here this morning? I know, I know you got family here. So take your Bible, turn to Matthew, please. Chapter 18, Matthew 18. Do you realize who is here this morning? Matthew 18. Who did you come for? Who did you come to meet? Matthew 18 and verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there is the preacher in the midst of them. Is that what it says? No. There I am. We're unaware of such a great gift. We're unaware that there are two kingdoms coexisting, the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of God. Invest your life in this world and you will end up worm food in your soul in hell. But invest your life in the kingdom of God and you will have everything. Go to Matthew 6, 33. You say everything? Yeah, I mean everything. You know, one of these days... Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates are going to be, if they ever get to heaven, they're going to be sweeping the street. And I'm going to be living in a mansion. Matthew 6, says this, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You invest your life in the kingdom of God, and you'll have everything. Ephesians 6 now, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6.10, finally, my brethren, Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of who? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places the reality is we are so dense so unaware that there is something more going on than what we can see feel hear and touch it's too easy to disregard hell there are too many people in this room right now who say i don't believe in hell you can believe that all your life but one day you will believe it and I stake my life on it, I will give my life to warn and to say, don't go there being stupid. Don't fight the God, the only God, who became man and tried to earn your trust, allowing religious people to kill him. If there's any battle going on, it's a battle for your soul. People too easily disregard hell 
We go through life. It's too bothersome to see beyond all the biz, biz, busyness of your day. It's too, too much time to worry about people besides your customers, beside all your problems and your schedules. Do you know what the worth of one soul is? Just look down for a second. Beneath us is dirt. But in the mixture of all of that dirt, you go down, there are diamonds, gold, rubies, sapphires. There is silver. There is platinum. There's every mineral. There is wealth in this planet. They took some of it and made it into um, uh, you know, treasures. I mean, the, the crown treasures over there in England are worth how many billions and stuff. The, the, all of the things that we've accumulated, and Jesus said, you can't exchange one soul for the world. The value of one soul. We're unaware of the value of things we can't see. Self-sufficiency is killing us. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. Self-sufficiency has cut us off from the source of our success. And very, really, the source of our life, which is Jesus himself. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 says this, And unto the angel of the church, this isn't the unsaved, this is to the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would, thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Why? What's the problem, Lord? What does it matter? Verse 17, because thou sayest, you believe that I am rich. Not talking about God, but talking about the Christian. The Christian saying, I'm fine. I'm rich. I'm increased with goods. And you know your closets are stuffed. Your uh, sheds are filled your, your house is packed with stuff. You don't need anything more except newer stuff. I'm rich, increased with goods. I have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and naked, and blind and naked. You know, we're a lot like, we're a, lot like a, uh, uh, a cluster of grapes that have separated themselves from a vine. We think we can go along and thrive without the, uh, the, the vine, and we can't. They've got to pick those grapes. If you're going to make grape juice, you've got to pick those grapes and freshly squeeze them because you set that aside in the sun, you've got two days before it shrivels up and the skin loses all its value and it becomes unusable. Two days. I guarantee you, you go two days without reading your Bible, without you praying, your soul is like a, like a raisin. You want to be full of life? Abide in the vine. We've, we're too self sufficient We're in the West. Why don't we go live in India for a little bit? Why don't we go live in Bangladesh? Why don't we go live in Nigeria for a little bit and find out how hard it is to be a Christian and then we'll be dependent upon God? Amen? Don't do that. We've gotten so used to relying on Google, on the government handouts, on science, on money in our pockets that we think we don't need God much anymore. But it gets the worst of it all, there is no fear of God. Romans. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none, verse 11, that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. Go down to verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And folks, it's bad. It's bad out there. People are flaunting such wicked, sinful lifestyles. Such filthy words are coming out in almost every sentence. There is such rebellion and disrespect ingrained into children. Not from the TV, but from the parents. No fear of God. You know why this generation does not fear God? Because Christians stopped fearing God. Ouch. 
So what are God's breakthroughs? Acts 12. Acts chapter 12. Acts 12 in verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex, to trouble, to kill certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Can you imagine the grief of that? The apostle John's own brother, James, is killed by Herod, verse 3. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread, verse 4. And when he had apprehended Peter, he put him in prison, delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers, 16 soldiers, to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people, to kill him in front of everybody. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but what? Prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. What's the first breakthrough is a praying church is needed. If we're going to see, if I'm going to see anything beyond what I can do happen in my life, it's going to happen where I pray. See, we don't need a rich church. We don't need money, folks. We need to pray. A lot of times we want to live trouble-free, but we don't need to be free of troubles. We need to, be, we need to live free of worry where we cast everything on God and we know to trust Him. See, this was a church that needed God. And God honored it. God freed Peter because of the prayers of God's people. Secondly, we need a believing church. Romans chapter 4, Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. When he had no baby, he's waiting 25 years. Yes, he messes up. Yes, he makes wrong decisions and he gets himself in trouble. But through it all, he says, but God, you've got to come through. I don't know how, but I'm going to trust you. That's the way to pray. Psalm 72, I want you to go here. Go to Psalm 72. Psalm 72 and verse 18. I don't know how long I'm going to preach. Don't, don't get too hurried. It'll only be a few minutes, more minutes. But you know what? If you hunger for God like I am right now, I pray you're not worried about what you're going to do in the next 30 minutes, but what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Psalm 72, 18. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who what? Who only doeth wondrous things. That's cool. Why don't you ask... God who never does anything boring. God who never does anything lame. Who never makes any mistakes. Why don't you ask him to do something wonderful? Psalm 86 in verse 10. Psalm 86 in verse 10. For thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Back to Psalm 81. Psalm 81 in verse 10 kind of a, 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 a key verse for me right now that I'm praying, but Psalm 81.10 says this, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. I like this. Open thy mouth wide, and I will dabble in it. I'll dribble a little bit of blessing in there. No, he says, I will fill it. But my people, verse 11, would not hearken to my voice. And Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust. And they walked in their own conceits. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and that Israel had walked in my ways. I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. Jeremiah. Jeremiah to the right. Right after Isaiah. Jeremiah 33 in verse 3. Jeremiah 33, 3. Pray in church, a believing church. Jeremiah 33, 3, God says, go ahead, call unto me. I don't leave my mobile phone downstairs while I'm upstairs. Amen. <laughs> you can always call right at me and get me every time. Call unto me and I will answer thee, and I'll show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. A breakthrough comes when a church is hungry and desperate for God. I'll quote again Psalm 62. O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. I want to see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. 
when you're hungry, you'll, you'll, you'll stop what you're doing and you'll go and satisfy that hunger. Why don't we make it for things that are, are, are valuable, things that are priceless, things that are eternal in a repentant church? We started to read Isaiah 59. And it says that God's hand is not shortened, His ear is not heavy, but your iniquities. Our sins have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. Who is God talking to? To the unsaved? To Leo Varadkar? Is he talk he's talking to the Christian. He's talking to his people. And he says, if we would repent, if we would say, you know what, I've let the devil God control this mouth. I've let the devil control these eyes. I've let the devil control my thoughts for enough time. I'm turning away from that saying, God, you take control now. I'm sorry, because I need you. I want to see your glory in my life. And in my church, and a faithful church, by the way. You know, faithful means consistent. It's no good for a young man to say to a young lady, I love you, and not mean it forever. It's no good when, when, when we start to make a commitment for the Lord, and then we say, no, it's too hard, and jump ship. We need a faithful church. We need people who work hard reaching this generation. That's why we more, do more than just come together on a Sunday. We do serious Bible learning. We do children's church. We do teen church. We spend a ton of our money. We put that money in that green box so that we can, can go and get people to hear the gospel. We do things at our expense so that people will hear the gospel. It takes work. It takes our money. There's no entitlements for that. The next week here, this next, not this coming week, but the week after that is going to be one of the most tiring weeks in a long time. Why do we do it? Why would we work so hard? Because I want to be faithful. These people in the Old Testament and the New Testament, when they saw the glory of God, they yearned for it again and again, and they went all out. They never stopped. I don't want to stop either. Why, why are you having such a big day? Why are you even trying? Why don't we just have a nice Sunday and then go for dinner? Because it's not about us. I love having the Christmas dinners and anniversary dinners, but I want to see God do something. Psalm 126. Psalm 126. Listen to David describe what it means to work hard. Psalm 126 in verse 4. Turn again our captivity, O Lord. As the streams in the south, turn it. Why? Why can he pray that God would change things? Because they that sow, that's planting, in tears, why are they crying? They're crying because it's hard work. It's because it takes time. Because you can't sit there and just type on your computer. There's no app for planting. You have to do it yourself. And they that sow and work to the point of tears can trust that they will reap in what? And he that goeth forth, doing whatever God asks you to do, and weepeth, bearing precious. Where's the precious seed? You've got it in your hands. Word of God, bearing precious seeds shall, I love that word, doubtless, without a doubt, come back again with rejoicing, bringing fruit, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, some of us are working flat out. I've been working flat out for 39 years. I never realized that when I was, I was, uh, I was just a, a new Christian. This guy, I want to call him Bill. I'm not sure whether his, his name was Bill or Joe. I just know that he was six foot six. He wore a 10-gallon hat. He had a handlebar mustache that he greased. And this guy came up to me. I'm sitting in church um, on a Sunday morning, waiting for church to start. And he comes right up to me, looking right. What are you doing next Saturday morning? And I looked at him and I said, I don't know. 
<laughs> 17 years old. He says, meet me here at 9.30. We're going to go get some kids for Sunday school. And I went, okay. <laughs> I wasn't going to argue with him. And from that Saturday, I've been door knocking almost all the time. I wouldn't change and trade my life for anything. I've worked full time. I've courted full time trying to get, get her attention. She wasn't interested. I, I've helped raise, Nita raised them. I helped raise five kids. I've, I've done everything that's required, but I never stopped serving God and working hard at it to the point of tears, knowing that it's going to bring forth fruit. We need a faithful church of people like that. Let me ask you this. What are we? Are we faithful? Well, next week, will you be missing because you got a hangnail? You're going to be missing because you got upset? Here's the invitation. Will this church help me Reach some people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you help me? There are too few laborers. Jesus had it. He said the laborers are few. Let's buck, buck that system. Let's, let's change that trend. Will you work like there's no tomorrow with me? Will you this week say, boy, pastor really made me upset. I guess i got to pray. Will you pray for souls to get saved next Sunday? Will you pray for Bruce Fry to preach? Don't just come saying, I hope he's good. You know what? If he flops, it'll be your fault. Amen? Because you didn't pray. I need you to beg God, God bless him, help him, help us. And this, this, this city, hear the gospel. Will you work inviting everyone you meet to come out and hear the gospel? Will you examine your own heart and see if there's anything that's blocking the blessings and the power and the glory of God? You know what? Maybe you're someone that needs the gospel yourself. Now, I preach this way because that's me. But I don't hate any one of you. I'm not upset with any one of you. I love you. I take you as you are. I just have a burden. I want to I be where God is doing something. I want to see it in your family. I don't want to read about it in the Bible. I want to read about it in your life. I want to see God work in the sanctuary just like he's done in the past. But he can't, he can't do it in, in your life until you finally let him save your soul. See, Jesus came to take your place in death. He was punished for your sin. He rose again so that you could trust him. That he knows what he's talking about, and you can follow him. Is there anybody this morning that'll decide that Jesus is worth following? Believing him with all your heart. Not that you fully understand him, but you say, I believe him. I believe he died for me. And that when he was buried, he went through all that thing to fulfill all the prophecies so that I could trust him. And one day, three days later, he got up, and he's alive, and I just want to live for him now. You just need to cry out to him and say, Lord, save me. If you can call Lazarus back from the dead, would you call me out of my death, out of my sin into that eternal life? I want to be saved this morning. You can't save yourself. You can't pay off your wrongs. You just need, you just need to believe that Jesus is all you need. Will you do that? Stand with me. Bow in prayer. Every head bowed, please. Nobody looking around. 25 years, 25 years. A lot of people come through these doors. Can't preach to them, I'm preaching to you. Can we beg God to do something in our midst, in our years, now? Our kids need to see it. I need to see it. I hope you're hungry for it. Dear friend, if you're not born again, why wait? This is not about, not about your performance, what you've got to do, what you've got to give up. This is about you deciding, I quit. I quit trying to argue with the only one who ever loved me. I quit trying to figure it out. I just trust. I just trust. 
Would you tell God that? Say, Lord, I just trust you. And I'll follow you for the rest of my life. Please just save me. Pastor can't save me. Nobody can't, but I'm trusting you to save me today. Why don't you, why don't you talk to God right now? I did 39 years ago. I've never looked back. Matter of fact, everything I've got, God gave me, and it's been great. Some of it's hard because that's what I need, but it's been good. Would you, would you just trust the Lord to take your life and make something out of it if you gave Him everything, sins and all, and give you a new life? If you're a Christian, He gave you that new life. It's time we lived it for Him to see His glory in our sanctuary. Father, bless these thoughts. To these people this morning, oh, that we would see your glory and your power. I don't know what you're going to do. I'm asking for things, but I know when you do things, it'll be beyond what I could ask or think. So go ahead. Just make it glorious. I just want to see some people saved. I want to see some marriages fixed. I just want to see some Christians restored. I just want to see... The devil kicked out. I just like to see some good things. Whatever you're going to do, I want to be hungry for it. In Jesus' name, amen.